Um, Kate's going to be speaking about fit for purpose, reworking the 21st century global economy. Um, how can we redesign the global economy so it's really fit for this century? Humanity's 21st century challenge is to meet the needs of all within the constraints of the planet, to make sure that no one falls short on life's essentials, um, from food and housing to healthcare and political voice. Um, in other words, while ensuring collectively that we don't overshoot the planetary boundaries, I know Kate's going to talk to us a lot about that. Um, Kate really needs no introduction. She was uh, my colleague formerly at Oxfam. Um, she was there for a good decade or so, right, Kate? Um, before that, she was co-author of the UN uh, Human Development Report. She is the author of the best-selling uh, book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, um, which was the Financial Times uh, Book of the Year, or one of them, in 2017. Um, she did a great uh, TED Talk last year um, that's been viewed many times and was one of the top uh, the TED Talks for last year. So it's brilliant that you're here, Kate. Thank you very much for coming. I'm going to hand the floor over to Kate in just a second, but I know we were both keen to know what was on your mind as you've stepped into the room. Um, so just a couple of thoughts from you. Any burning question that you have that you're going to ask Kate later. She's going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have quite an interactive 45-minute session. But um, we'd like to know what's on your mind. So any, any thoughts? Why are we here? What do you want to find out this evening in our hour and a half together? No one's got a thought. I'm sure that's not true yet. Come on. We're gonna, we've got some mics because we're, we're live streaming. So just so that people, anyone who's uh, remotely connected, please do contribute to the mic. So just who you are and just a burning question or thought. Okay. I, I'm Jill Shankerman. I'm a, a member of the public and I work on development, uh, foreign direct investment projects in developing countries. Uh, so we failed so dismally in the 20th century to achieve all those goals you've got. And now we've got these huge environmental challenges as well. So I want to know whether you can provide any, uh, any grounds for optimism. Okay, we're looking for some optimism. Okay, great. Um, another thought, somebody over this side. Emma, you've got the mic in your hand. Go on, what's a burning question? Um, so, so Please I'm, introduce yourself as well. Sorry, I'm, I'm Emma Burnett. I'm a PhD student, and I'm looking at um, what essentially is agricultural economics. Um, and I'm interested in how we can bring the different strands of alternative economies that are going about right now together and actually use them to make change rather than just talking about how cool they are. Okay, so moving from new ideas to actually changing things in practice. Yeah, and we've got two more thoughts, so I can see... Oh, we've got three. I'm going to go... Okay, so... Well, look, oh, now, now some people have braved the floor. We've got a few thoughts. I'm going to take four more very quick points, and then we're going to hand over to Kate. Yeah. Hi, I'm David Bagshaw Cope. I guess in this uh, regard, I'm a member of the public rather than anything else. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on whether or not universities and other educational institutions are teaching the next generation of leaders in economics and public policy the right thinking on economics. Okay, great. So really thinking about how we're, treating, how we're training the next generation. Okay, we'll get a couple more thoughts. Yeah. Yes, hello. Alistair Morris, um, member of the public. Um, just wondered how, um, I don't know if this is a very basic question, but um, how much of an impact Brexit will have on, on mm. trying to achieve these goals and whether um, surely in a global economy we should all be, there is an argument for us all to be sticking together and working together to solve these Hmm. global problems and, and yes so global challenges in the time of sort of nationalism yeah. how do we sort how do we resolve that kind of tension okay yeah hi um, i'm a biology student i'm interested in growth and whether a steady state economy or um, circular economy are actually compatible with biological growth so the evolution of life continually getting more complex and building up greater biomass over time and whether what we are doing with economic growth is um, just a part of that. What's your name? Robert. Brilliant. And we're not going to, just, Kate, you don't have to answer all of these straight away. And what you don't get to, we will come back to in Q&A. But it's a good sense of what's who's in the room. Yeah, go on then. One last contribution from you, and then I'm going to give Kate the floor. Hi, thanks. Yeah. I'm Andrew. I'm uh, one of the master students here. Um, my question is, going off the first question over there, um, is there any sense for optimism, especially with the United States? And... Um, you know, diminishing aid budgets, less of an emphasis on trying to help global climate change and just generally being, I guess you could say, less of a team player globally overall. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Kate, with those provo sort of thought-provoking uh, contributions from the floor, everything about from how we teach economics, how we move from ideas into action, to how we solve sort of global problems. Um, the floor is yours, please. Fantastic, thank you, Emily. And of course, there's no greater pleasure than to suddenly find yourself in a completely different institution with one of your favorite colleagues and some of your lovely ex-Oxfam colleagues dotted around the room. You never actually leave Oxfam, you become ex-Fam. And it's a wonderful family to be part of, and it's lovely to see that Xfam is here tonight. So thank you, Emily. And I'm really, really delighted and obviously honored to be here um, at the Blavatnik School of Government as part of the program on global economic governance. Uh, incredibly important ideas and concepts for our times, as some of these questions have already implied. I want to start with a question. Who here has ever studied economics? Put your hand up if you've ever studied economics. Any, okay, quite a few. And then who here has never studied economics and can't, can't quite believe you've even come to a talk with the word economy or economics in the title? Yes, bravely put your hand up. Yes, okay. There's always both kind of people in the room, and I'm, I really want to make this work for everybody. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about donut economics. For the medics and the room, please, I need to do the health warning so I don't get in trouble. Please don't eat too many donuts. We know they're not good for us. I'm going to introduce you tonight to the only one that actually turns out to be any good for us. And it's just an idea. It's conceptual, OK? So you don't need to digest it in any other form. But I'm also going to tell you a little bit about myself. Emily has generously done that. But I always find when I'm hearing somebody talk, I want to know, well, who are you? I mean, where did you, where have you worked? What have you experienced? And what training did you have? Because these things shape us. They shape our world views. They shape what we see and what we don't see. So I always feel I should start by explaining. So many people said, well, I'm just a member of the public. You know what? I am too. I'm just a member of the public. Um, we all are. We find ourselves in different roles. But I'll tell you, as a member of the public, how I came to be here and writing about donut economics. So I'm 48 years old. So I was a teenager of the 1980s. A few people in the room were in the 1980s. You remember Duran Duran and Michael Jackson and Madonna was the new kid on the block. And there was a famine in Ethiopia, and it was a defining event for anybody who remembers the 1980s, and a hole opening up in the ozone layer. And as I was a teenager, and this is how I began to learn about the world, I f had this sense that I wanted to be part of doing something about it to help change that. So I felt the best way I could equip myself was to study economics. It is, after all, the mother tongue of public policy. So this is a photograph of me, aged 18 merrily reading my first economics textbook on the way to this university to study PPE. I'm reading a book called Positive Economics by David Lipsy. Some of you may well even have read the same book. Uh, I should have been suspicious already. Anybody who dares to call a book positive economic, it doesn't mean thumbs up economics. It means value neutral economics. This is objective. There's no values in here. I mean, really, we should smell a rat from day one if economics presents it itself. I didn't. I hadn't done the A-level. I was busily trying to catch up, so I understood the basics. It took me a while, but I gradually became frustrated with what I was being taught because the issues I cared most about that have motivated me to come to study this subject were at the margins of the syllabus. And to go to David's question, I believe they still are at the margins of the syllabus. So a lot of the critique I'm making, absolutely yes, and I'm, I'm critical of the way economics is taught in this university and almost every other. We have not moved on, and that's the only reason why I wrote this book, to push us to move on. Because the issues I cared about, like social justice, like e environmental integrity, sure, you could study them, but you had to go and find them. You had to go off and do a special paper, even today. In environment, I think it's called something like the economics of the earth, which is a very strange title for a paper. Uh, you have to go and find them. If you want to do feminist economics, oh, that's really quite weird. Go and do a PhD on that. So the issues that I believe it should be at the heart of economics are peripheral. I did a master's degree um, in economics for development, which made a lot more sense than anything else I've been taught, but I did not want to go on and do a PhD. I began to, to be very frank, I began to be embarrassed of the framing and the worldview that I was being taught. I did not want to introduce myself as, hello, I'm an economist. I didn't like it. So I didn't do a PhD. I walked away from academic economics, and I went and worked as an ODI fellow, as some of you may know. You're placed for two years to work as a civil servant of a low-income country. I was in the Ministry of Trade, Industries, and Marketing in Zanzibar, working with barefoot entrepreneurs, probably the most important foundational and memorable job I'll ever have had in my life. 
Uh, after that, I went to a very different island. I worked in New York on the Human Development Report, one of the team writing the annual reports, Human Development and Human Rights, Human Development and New Technologies. And it was a wonderful opening up of different ways of thinking, but also I was part of this team that was reframing from the World Bank that wrote the World Develop, the World Econ sorry, the World, the World Development Report, and every year they ranked the world's countries in terms of their growth rates and their GDP. And we were the Human Development Report, and we were ranking the world's countries in terms of people's life expectancy, education, and income per person. A very different concept, and I know it deeply shaped me. I left that job and moved to Oxford. The reason I live in Oxford is because I joined Oxfam and worked there for over a decade and loved it and campaigned on women workers' rights in global supply chains and to make visible the exploitation of women at the end of those global supply chains and the role of unpaid caring work by women, which is left visible, invisible in mainstream economics, campaigning to show that climate change is not just an environmental issue, it's a matter of social justice and that organizations like Oxfam should and did campaign on it. And then I became a mother 10 years ago of twins and I really started to understand gender and development and life work balance in a way that is merely theoretical until you're changing two nappies at the same time. At this point, I look back. Maternity leave at least has a real benefit of allowing you to reflect. And I look back. This was the first decade of my career. And I, in fact, sorry, the first 20 years of my career. And I realized that I had spent most of my career to this point in one way or another, trying to make visible those things that are left invisible by mainstream economics. The unpaid caring work of women, in which I was immersed. The impacts of climate change. The exploitation of workers in global supply chains. And I just thought, I don't want to spend the next 20 years and the rest of my career calling from the margins, trying to make these things visible. It also happened to be 2008. So there was a massive great financial crisis going on and a lot of effort going into creating new institutions that were going to do new economic thinking in response to a financial crisis. And I thought, I'll be darned if we're going to sit by and have new financial economic thinking. We have to do the ecological crisis, the inequality crisis at the same time. So I left my job at Oxfam in order to write this book. And I immersed myself in all the economics I was never taught in ecological economics to start with, feminist economics, uh, complexity, behavioral, institutional economics. And there were amazing insights in these, but they're all off in their own journals, at their own conferences, in their own blogs. And I thought, what happens when you make them dance together on the same page? And that was really my aim in writing this book. And so today I now teach at the Environmental Change Institute on South Parts Road, uh, which I love because it brings these things together. And I talk about donut economics, and I see myself one foot in academia and one foot very firmly in advocacy for transformation. So that's why I, as a member of the public, too, am here tonight. Why economics matters, and I'm going to argue that actually it's the first course in economics that matters the most, because think of the people who are sitting in this parliament. Think of the people in this boardroom, the people who write these newspapers. Many of them will have studied economics, but only a little bit. Very few MPs have a PhD in economics. Very few even have a master's degree. But many of them will have done an undergraduate or Econ 101. So it's the first course that matters the most because it most deeply frames the public understanding of economics. And that's why it's no good to say, well, Econ 101, that's just, you know, that's just beginner stuff. Stay on and do a PhD. No, it's the one that we have to change the most. It goes the deepest in our framing. And so that means we have to go to the places where economics are taught and really think about those fundamental ideas. I believe the, the, the first ideas we learn are the most powerful. If you listen to cognitive linguists or people who work on visual and verbal framing, they profoundly shape our mindsets, especially the pictures, even more than the words. And they go into the back of our heads where the visual cortex is, and they sit there and they shape the way you see the world. They shape what you put at the center, what you leave at the periphery, what you notice, what you don't, what you name, what goes unnamed. So we really need to examine the images we have. And when professors challenge me and say, this is a straw man you hold up, I say, come on then, bring it on. Show me the first image you teach in economics. Show me the biggest picture you have of the economy. Show me how you depict humanity, our selfie. So let me just ask the economist, the first image you remember learning in economics, what was it? Thank you, supply and demand. By the way, it's the same answer the world over. <laughs> supply and demand. That is not a neutral act. I mean, economics means, from the ancient Greek, the art of household management. What an extraordinary noble art, and one that we need today, to manage our planetary household in the interests of all its inhabitants. 
Why then do we immediately go, welcome to economics, here is the market? That's a very specific thing to do. And what it does on day one is it tells us the economy is essentially the market. And it applies that markets in equilibrium. I'm not even really going to go there tonight, but we know that's not true. But it centers and foregrounds price as the metric by which we conduct economics. And of course, as we know, things that fall outside of price, outside of contracts, they're known as externalities. Well, in the 21st century, if we're going to tell economic students, if you want to talk about climate change, uh, hole in the ozone layer, biodiversity loss, we offer you two words. These are environmental externalities. Already alarm bells should be going off that this is not going to go well. We cannot talk about the death of the living planet on which all of our lives depend as an environmental externality in economics. What about the biggest image that's taught? It's the circular flow diagram drawn by Paul Samuelson uh, in 1948 in his textbook. This is a modern derivation of it, but it's the, the, the core idea is the same. You've got households and business in the essential market relationship. Households provide labor and capital. In return, they get wages and profit. They can use that money for consumer spending. In return, they get goods and services. So the money goes round and round, and so do the resources. And yes, there are some leakages. Some goes off into savings as banks, and they put that back as investment. We all know that's not how banking works. Banks create money as debt bearing interest. I'm not even going to touch that tonight. Some goes off as taxes for government, and then they can spend it. We also know that's not the only way that governments can create and spend money. I'm not even going to go there tonight either. And some goes off for imports, but money comes back in through exports. The essence here is that this is a closed and circular system. Though, and it's very good for, for measuring national accounts and measuring GDP. It's the fundamental model. But those arrows only track what gets monetized. And it's self-contained, as if the economy were a self-contained flow. Samuelson drew it because he wanted to show that when you pay people wages, they can spend money, and then companies can hire people. So he wanted to show that interdependence, and it's an incredibly important feedback loop. But it's still the biggest picture that we have of the economic actors in their relationships today, and that is extraordinary, because it is screaming with its blank spaces. For a start, it makes absolutely no mention of the living world. Firms run businesses apparently on labor and capital. Where are all the materials and matter? This building is beautifully made of wood everywhere, but also energy and the synthetic material, all the energy and matter that's drawn in and spewed out as waste of pollution. It's completely silent on the unpaid caring work of parents, particularly women. All that cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising the children that goes into making labor fresh and ready for work every day as if it just arrives ready, hey presto, at the factory door. But there's all that reproductive work invisible. And it's silent on the commons, the place where people get together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community and co-create goods and services they value. Well, if the biggest picture we have of the economy and that model that we put in our minds and in our students' minds misses the living world, unpaid caring work, and the commons, three of the most fundamental sources of our well-being, this is not going to go well, and we're not going to do justice to the potential and the possibilities that we have. And the last one, what about the selfie, the portrait of humanity? Rational like economic man, as he's known, never gets drawn, so I decided to draw him. He'd have to look a bit like this. He would be a man, no dependents, standing alone. He's got money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. You're laughing, but you know it's true. He hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. And the real problem with this model is not just how absurdly narrow that is. It's that on being told that we are like him, or sorry, on being, told, yeah, on being told that he is like us, we actually become more like him. Research shows that when students learn about this portrait of humanity from year one to year two to year three of their studies, over time they say they more value competition and self-interest as traits, and they less value collaboration and altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become which means there's an extraordinary responsibility for any academic discipline which claims to tell us who we are, because it changes who we become. Those are the fundamentals. What about the 20th century economic laws of motion? Economists since the 1870s have wanted to show that economics was a science as reputable as physics. They looked to the great of the day, Isaac Newton, who'd shown the physical laws of motion. And whether wittingly or not, economists set off on the pursuit of uncovering the economic laws of motion. And there are three apparent economic laws of motion that have profoundly influenced all of our lives. The first one on inequality. Simon Kuznets in the 1950s had a little bit of data from the UK, the US, and Germany 
on what happens over time to levels of inequality in countries. He plotted it on the page and he said, I think I see a pattern. As countries get richer over time, first inequality increases, but somehow it decreases. And he couldn't understand it. It didn't make sense to him. He tried to explain it. Maybe it was something to do with rural to urban migration. Only in 2014, when Thomas Piketty comes along, he looks back at the data, he plots the curve, he says, Kuznets had it right. That's what the curve shows. But it was an extraordinary moment, an anomalous moment in time. Kuznets was measuring from pre-war to post-war. And war destroys the capital of the wealthy. And post-war governments invested in health and education and housing. So it was war and government intervention that bent that curve down. It's not the inherent workings of the market. But by the time the curve got drawn on the page and got dubbed the Kuznets curve, it whispers out this story of its own, which is that growth will even things up again. And we've all witnessed it in trickle-down economics, in austerity economics, in the promise that if we tighten our belts and pull through, we'll all come out better on the other side. It doesn't hold up. But this diagram, I really hope it's no longer taught. It might be taught as a historical artifact. But it has a very, very long tail of influence because the people in power today, well, they're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. This is what they were taught. A long tail, a long shadow of ideas. The second one on pollution. In the 1990s, some economists plotted it on the chart. It looked so similar, they rather unimaginatively just called it the environmental Kuznets curve. It looks like as countries get richer, first pollution increases, but then it decreases. They gave the caveat. We've only looked at local air and water pollutants. But by the time the curve is drawn, it whispers out that message. If you care about the planet, don't intervene, don't regulate. You might get in the way of innovation. And growth, like a well-trained child, seems to clean up after itself. Except as most parents know, they don't. <laughs> and if we actually look not just at local data, but at global data, at greenhouse gas emissions, at a global ecological footprint, this curve does not bend down. So these are false economic laws of motion. But the third one is persistent, and these two justified it. And it's the idea that growth is and will and can be endless. It's so deeply rooted, we don't even talk about it. I, I, I invite anybody to tell me that they studied economics, and in their economics class, there was a session in which they talked about why do we assume there will always be growth, and can there always be growth, and what happens if it isn't coming? And should we always want growth? It's barely even discussed. This curve is never actually drawn, but it sits in the back of all of our imaginations because we're told that when policies lead to growth, somehow we tick the box and it's a good policy. So this lives on. So let's turn to the big guy of 20th century economics, at least according to British people. John Maynard Keynes. I love this quote, 1936. Economics is the science of thinking in terms of models, yes joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world. I absolutely believe if Keynes were alive today, he'd be the first to roll up his sleeves and say, my heck, the world has changed. You know such different things about the contemporary world than we knew. Get on with designing some new models. It's the art of choosing new models. Let's get on with it. And I want to offer the beginnings of what I think need to lie at the heart of that. So let's not start economics with supply and demand, welcome to the market. Let's start where a question I was never invited to ask, and I'm going to bet most of you weren't either. What's the purpose of the economy? What's the point? What's it for? If we don't know what it's for, how on earth do you know what success looks like? And I offer this donut as one way of expressing the purpose of the 21st century economy. So imagine humanity's use of resources radiating out from the middle of that circle. So the hole in the middle is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life. It's where they don't have the food and water and housing and health care and political voice that every person has a claim to, to lead a life of dignity, opportunity, and community. And I crowdsource those 12 social values from the world's governments. They are from the Sustainable Development Goals. So every government in the world has already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these needs. So we want everybody out of the hole in the middle and into the green ring itself. You could say that was the 20th century agenda of human rights. But now we know more. Now we know more about our deep interdependence with this unique, fragile, delicately balanced living planet. And we know that we cannot use Earth's resources so much to the extent that at some point we began to push ourselves out of balance. We go over what are known as planetary boundaries. And these nine dimensions around the outside were drawn up a decade ago by leading Earth system scientists who believe they are the nine critical life-supporting systems that keep our planet in this delicate balance that we know as the Holocene, the state of the planet for the last 11,000 years 
in which all human society was created and has thrived. So then the challenge becomes twofold. We want to use resources to meet everybody's needs for energy and housing and water and food, but we must avoid causing climate breakdown or acidifying the oceans, critical levels of biodiversity loss, converting too much of Earth's land for human use, drying up the rivers. So we need to find a balance, meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. And already, this idea we, we got from 20th century economics that, that what the, the economy is trying to do is grow endlessly, it's a very different shape. We're trying to find balance now. It's a totally different shape in our bodies and our minds. And I think it's the fundamental transformation we need to make. Thinking, as we know in bodily health, our own health lies in balance. Have enough water and food and oxygen and exercise, but not too much of any of those, because too much of any one will be unhealthy for us. Health lies in balance. So from bodily health to planetary health, health of our planet lies in balance. But if this is where we are today, the goal where we want to get to, what's the state of play? And all the red here shows you the state of our living world. I call this our selfie, the state of humanity in these early days of the 21st century. So all the red on the inside is the extent to which people are falling short on these senses of life. Here on food, for example, that red wedge goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. And then this climate change wedge, the ecological ceiling here is at 350 parts per million, and we are well over 400 parts per million. So we're falling short on every one of those social dimensions. For people in countries rich and poor, mostly poor, but also there's the, just go to corn market, we know that there is the poverty in the midst of plenty. And we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate breakdown, biodiversity loss, land conversion, and excessive fertilizer use. So that's the state of the planet. That's the state of us in relation to our planetary home. And if looking at a diagram doesn't do it for you, let me bring it home in some headlines. In October last year, the IPCC told us we have 12 years to turn around our relationship to climate breakdown. You didn't miss WWF's report that said, since 1970, the year I was born, all other animal populations have declined by 60%. Extraordinary. There are microplastics in human bodies, the planet over, children breathing toxic air, land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus pollution reaching dangerous levels worldwide, ocean acidification, hitting levels not seen in 14 million years. And thanks to Oxfam, the statistic that everybody now knows, the richest 1% of people own half the world's wealth. To be honest, I can't actually get my head around that. The richest 1% of people own half the world's wealth. In the words of the US writer William Burroughs, after taking one look at this planet, any visitor from outer space would say, I want to see the manager. And we laugh because we know there's something tricky there. Any stand-up comic will tell you when people laugh, it's because it's true. So since we're in the school of government and talking about global economic governance and this question of I want to see the manager, I just want to get a little spot check of who we think the manager is. So I'm going to use my invisible laser. Here's how it works. I'm going to go like this around the room. And when the laser passes you, if you feel so moved, shout out who you think the manager is or the managers are, OK? All right, we're going to go. Ready? <laughs> and if you think there's none, you can shout none. Shout louder, guys. Okay, there's lots of potential managers from me to the ministers to the corporates to none. We could, well, I could stop right now. We could just have a fantastic conversation about that. Uh, if this makes you feel miserable on your Wednesday night, let me give you the one good piece of news. NASA says, hole in Earth's ozone layer finally closing up because humans did something about it. I love that. And because, of course, we can do something about all of this. We caused all of this. We can do something about all of this. The question is, will we, how we, how will we, and when will we, and who the heck are the managers? 
Researchers at Leeds University took this global picture that I made and took it down to the level that we so often want to take it to, which is the national story. So the way they've drawn these, they've done 150 national donuts. I really advise you go to their website if you want to look up a country you care about. So the way they've done it is you want to fill the, social, the, the, the blue circle in the middle blue. You want it to go blue, that's good. It's a very low global threshold, okay? But we want to fill it in blue, but you don't want to overshoot that green by a physical boundary. So at one end, we've got Zambia. Hardly overshooting any planetary boundaries, but massively falling short on meeting its people's needs. We've got China. Still not meeting people's needs, but already overshooting nearly all of those planetary boundaries. And then we've got, since we're here, we've got the UK. One of the richest countries in the world, but falling short on employment inequality. That feels familiar. And overshooting on nearly all of the planetary boundaries. Let me be very, very clear. When we're overshooting, it doesn't mean we're overshooting on resources we're digging and polluting here. This is a consumption-based footprint. So we're counting all the resources and the energy in the lights and the carpets and the wood and the clothes and all the phones in your pockets. Where did these come from all over the world? Let me now take that array and put it into a scatter plot. So what we've got going on here is you want to achieve all those social thresholds. There are 11 social thresholds in the middle, so you want to get to the minimum basic on all of them, but you want to do it without overshooting the boundaries of the planet. So that's the sweet spot where, we, where a country would meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And then this is where the 150 countries that they plotted are. So I call this, we are all developing countries now. In fact, I just don't use the language of developing and developed because I say, I've never been to a country that has the right to call itself developed. I mean, we've got the classic developing countries, right? Bangladesh, Philippines, India, Pakistan clustered here. And they are on an unprecedented journey. They need to meet the needs of all their people, but they just can't do it in the way that every country before them has done it. We know that the planetary systems can't take that overload. So they're on an unprecedented development of the journey. But then we've got these high-income countries up here, the UK and the US, Japan and Germany, and all European countries all clustered up here, also on an utterly unprecedented developmental journey. How do you maintain high living standards and well-being while coming back within planetary boundaries, which has never been done before, let alone barely tried? unprecedented developmental journey. And then we've got a third cluster, let's say, China and Egypt, South Africa, Turkey, Russia, Malaysia, often known around as emerging economies, let's say. Doubly the challenge. Both got to come back within planetary boundaries because they're already in some kind of overshoot and meeting the needs of people. So this is the century of development, and every country, I think, in a, in a humble way, needs to recognize that it is in a a developing country towards a new paradigm of what we think economic prosperity and human well-being is. And I just want to stop there and see if anybody's got a reaction to this. Or if you've got a very specific question or response, do you, do you agree that we're all developing countries now or you want to push back against that? Or Any, any thoughts in the room? Robert's got some. Uh, um, I have a thought just about this graph. In economic development, doesn't that push us in sort of a... Yeah, diagonal direction, because if you grow your economy, you use up resources in the environment, it pushes you, say, to the you know, northeast. And if there's economic decline, doesn't it push you to the southwest? How, is it, how does it even seem feasible to move along the other axis? And so you said economic development, and I, I would say, yes, the 20th century model and paradigm of what economic development is and how we achieve economic development, as we can see, has taken countries in that direction. And to me, the whole question is we need to, if we redefine prosperity and redefine what thriving looks like, it redefines what economic development is. And it completely, it's a completely different paradigm, which I believe should be being taught in economics classes and courses all over the world and isn't. Yeah. Yes. I totally get what you're saying, and I, and I like the graph, but what evidence is there that 8 billion people, or however many there will be in 10 years' time on the Earth, can all fit in the top left-hand corner? I, I get, I mean, there must be a, a number that works. If the, if the planet had 2 billion people, I could quite imagine we're all in the top left. If we had 20 billion, I would assume that we definitely couldn't. What, 
do you feel confident that eight billion could fit in the top left corner? So the question of how many people can we be to do this is a really important question. But it's not the only one. And let, let's, take, let's take the donut and say, what would it take for humanity to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet? And I often do this in workshops with students. I say, come up with ideas, and I want you to come up with factors to determine that. So simple that it might just be one word. And population is obviously one of them. Because if we're two billion, maybe we can say, yeah, that could be done. Uh, six, seven, eight, don't know what evidence is. There. Of course, there's no evidence, because we've not got there yet. Uh, 10, 20 at some point, you know, if we, we could find people in the room would vary. But it's not the only one. So population matters, but so does the level of inequality. And the, the, overshoot, of, the, the overshoot and shortfall that I showed you, I think, is uh, a symptom of the fact that 1% own half the world's wealth. That's why so many people don't even have enough food to eat every day. And yet we're massively overshooting on climate change. So it's population. It's scales of inequality. It's the technologies we use. Do we irrigate our fields by splashing water everywhere, or do we use drip irrigation, which is precision? So how efficiently and effectively do we use the resources we have and transform them into what we want? What about governance, the school of government? How do we govern ourselves from how we manage a village well to how a nation manages its resources to how we work when we go to the UN climate negotiations? All of these are factors, so I think population matters, but it's not the only determinant, and a lot of the other things, uh, we've actually got mo a lot more leverage for transforming, and that's why I think we absolutely need to transform our systems of governance and the de design of our economies themselves. Anybody got one more? Yes. Well, just in response to that, I yes. think Sorry. Um, the big hope is technology, isn't it? Uh, and that it can drive every possibility up to the top left-hand corner if you apply it right and if it's governed uh, right. I mean, if we think about the efficiency of a car or a power station, it's only 50% or something like that. The efficiency of solar panels is less than that. So there's a huge potential there. The question is, would unbridled capitalism in any way drive you up there or would it drive you off to the right? And then if you're not going to leave it unbridled, if you're going to bridle it, who <laughs> and right. how? I agree technology is hugely important, but as you then went on to say, it, who owns the technology and for what purpose are they putting it to use? And what kind of finance is behind that technology and what's that finance demanding as a return? And all of this, as you said, bridled or unbridled capitalism, is going to determine the uses of it. So I think it's all of it together. Okay, I'm going to thank you for these, these uh, ideas and challenges. I'm going to move on from here and ask, well, who are the different scales of managers, if we want to say, or the different ways in which we govern ourselves, where we can make change from here? Since we're at the national level, and let's take one of the biggest nations in the world, I was very um, struck and delighted, to be honest, when two years ago a student of mine from the Environmental Change Institute went back to Beijing, he was in a conference in Beijing, it was the launch of China's renewable energy outlook, and he texted me this photo from the conference, and he said the second picture that the professor launching the report put up was a donut. And I was really fascinated, and it's next to, any Chinese people in the room will be able to tell you, that next to a quote from President Xi saying, man must learn to live in harmony with nature and harmony with society. I was fascinated that this professor, on launching the report that explained how China was going to move from fossil fuels to renewable energy, had decided to use this image as a frame for reframing a paradigm that made sense of that. So there's transformation going on within governments of adopting a different kind of lens to start moving in this direction. Companies, lots of people have talked about corporations. I've spent, uh, over the last seven years, I've had a lot of fascinating conversations with companies, inviting them to seat themselves at this donut table and ask themselves, is the way you're doing business helping to bring humanity into this space? Or let's be honest, if you're a mainstream 20th century corporation, it's probably actually profiting by driving humanity out of this space. And these are some of the companies that I've either worked with or have told me we've used this within our own strategy meetings. So how are companies responding to this? And then urban designers, I was contacted by um, an urban designer and planner in Stockholm who said, um, we're actually de developing a new suburb of Stockholm, this sort of area here. There's an unopened train station, and this is going to become a new suburb. And he said, I've got the donut on the design table, and we're using it as a new blueprint. So city planners are using it. So all of these different people, you could say in some sense, are the managers. They're not the controlling, deciding managers, but every level 
is managing some polycentric version of governance. I love this building because it's like Eleanor Ostrom, I think, would have loved this building because it's like a polycentric building. There's these different slices all sitting together that don't, they're not identical, but we manage the local, we manage the city, we manage the corporate, we manage the national, we manage the global, and they all interlink. Then the question is, well, what mindset? If we could bring an economic mindset that would actually enable us to do this well, what would we bring? And I believe that the 20th century economic mindset is not fit for our times at all. And we are not moving beyond it in anything like the urgency that the students at universities, this one and worldwide, deserve to be taught in economics that's fit for the challenges they already know lies ahead. I believe we need to use new diagrams that help challenge and pre present a new mindset. So I never would start economics with supply and demand. I'd start at the question of what is the economy for. And the first diagram I show is the biggest diagram, and I call it the embedded economy diagram. If you know ecological economics, feminist economics, and commons theory, you'll see I've tried to combine them here. So you've got the economy embedded in society. It is a social organization itself, and it's embedded in political and legal and trust institutions, embedded in the living world, drawing in materials and matter, spewing out waste and pollution, bathed in a river of solar energy. But within the economy itself, we've got these four fundamental forms of provisioning. Yes, there's the market, and yes, there's the state. But the 20th century got so obsessed with the battle between the state and the market, let's say capitalism, state-loving socialism, it completely ignored two other fundamental forms of provisioning. The household, where every single person begins every day, that unpaid caring work between parents and partners and children. Of course, the irony is that when you're at university, you're plucked from the household, you live in accommodation. It's the one moment in life when you're not immersed in the space of un unpaid caring work of others, but we most need to get it. And then there's the commons, made famous by Eleanor Ostrom. People organizing, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community collaborating. And I believe we need that fuller sense of all these forms of economic activity and these different ways of provisioning, because I think they're all valuable. I wouldn't want to live in an economy that lacked any one of them. But they work best when they work together, and we need to rebalance the roles. I think the state, particularly, in terms of government, has a crucial role in rebalancing the relationship between the market and the household, rebalancing the relationship between the market and the commons, and indeed, rebalancing the relationship of the market and the state. Mariana Matsukata was here very recently, and she speaks very eloquently, I think, particularly on that dimension of rebalancing between the market and the state. And the state not just seeing itself as getting out of the way because it's just a sort of boring level playing fielder, it's a risk taker, it's a space maker, it tilts us in the direction we want to go. If we're changing the vision of the economy, then it also helps change the vision of ourselves as economic actors. Mainstream economics introduces us, because it introduces us to the market, we show up as a market character. We're either labor or producer. If you add a financial sector, you're creditor or debtor. But if we then bring back in, well, what about the household and the state and the commons? We shift from this individualist me to the we, and in the state, we could be citizen or public servant as doctor or teacher. We're a voter, but we're also a protester. In the household, we're parent, partner, neighbor, child, and in the commons, co-creator, sharer, repairer, and steward. And of course, we actually seamlessly weave in and out of these identities every day with almost barely noticing it. And if you've been following the school strike movement that's rippling worldwide thanks to Greta Thunberg. Right now I say we're all greatly in debt to the protester child who is actually the steward of the future. We need all of these relations and forms of being and they invite and demand different values from rational economic man who tells us to be competitive and self-interested. And so we need to equip ourselves with the skills of collaborating if we're going to actually create an economy that uses its full potential of human organizing to take on these extraordinary challenges we face. So how can we get into the donut? This is almost going back to Robert's question. Well, how, it doesn't economic development necessarily take us off in that direction. And I want to argue that growth won't even things up again. So don't wait for growth to tackle inequality. And it won't clean things up again. Don't wait for growth to solve pollution. We need to be distributive and regenerative by design. And I'll describe a little what I mean by each of those. So the economy we've inherited is degenerative by design, the best demonstrated with hose pipe, right? We take Earth's materials, we stuff them in the pipe of production, we make them into things we want, we use them for a while, and then we throw them away. And that is a take, make, use, lose 
one-way linear degenerative economic industrial system. This is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth's sources. And this is what it looks like when we continually dump into Earth's sinks. And I sincerely believe that our children, our grandchildren, will ask us, did you really think that was normal? Like, did, like, did that really happen? And you knew about it, and that was normal. Because it is disgusting. And yet we've become so used to it. That is what has been done in the name of economic development. And we have to turn that around. We have to turn that linear economy into a circular one. So the resources are never used up. They're used again and again. The biological nutrients are allowed to decompose and regenerate themselves, as nature's been doing for 3.8 billion years. But technical nutrients like this clicker and the lamps and the chairs and the synthetic carpets and the, all these materials have to be restored and refurbished and reused and, in the very last resort, recycled. The core concept here is that there's no such thing as waste. It's just a resource in the wrong place. That goes for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as it much goes for plastics in the oceans. Waste is food for another process. And I believe to really work, the circular economy needs to be open and modular by design. Brief illustration, two smartphones, utterly different in design. Here's an iPhone. If it breaks, I have to send it back to Apple because it's glued shut. It's, right, it's glued shut proprietary control technology. This one, however, is click open. This is a fair phone. And if it breaks or it needs upgrading or I want to adjust it, there's a video on YouTube that tells me how to click it open how to upgrade that battery, change that SIM, and it's open and modular by design. 20th century, glue shut. 21st century, click open. This is the design future we need. But will those corporations, through their own interests, choose to bring it about? What kind of governance needs to be put in place to make this the norm? Three examples. Houdini sportswear make all of their clothing either from wool and tensile, which are organic fibers, or from recycled nylon, recycled polyester. So they have two loops. And actually, they're the first company in the world to use the planetary boundaries and the donut framework to do a full assessment of their materials. And they hold themselves to extraordinarily high standards. If you're interested in that kind of companies taking this seriously, I very much recommend you take a look at that report. This is an open motors car. If you buy one, it turns up looking like this, like a wardrobe from Ikea, so good luck. <laughs> they say you can put it together in an hour if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you can take it to somebody who does, though, because it's open source. So how to assemble that chassis is available for anybody to see. And it's modular by design. You can put it together and take it apart, put it together, change just the piece that needs making. And once the chassis is assembled, it can be customized in different countries and communities and for purposes into, for example, an electric streetcar. I spoke to the CEO of Open Motors. They were going off down this direction of making electric streetcars, who everybody wants one, it's cute, to saying, actually, why do people need to own cars? I mean, what people really want is mobility. So now they're shifting into making AI self-driving cars. And now it's really important that they're modular because these don't just drive two hours a day, they drive 24 hours a day, in which case the part that's weak is going to break really, really fast. So you need to be able to replace just that part. To me, this is the kind of car company of the future that we want. And then the last one, again, more, more transport, shifting from ownership to service. So you don't even need to own a bike in this city as well. You can have the service of a bike, but of course you need the infrastructure this is the longest raised cycleway in a city in China, five kilometers. You need the infrastructure that makes it safe and sensible and effective to be a cyclist. We'd love a bit more of that in Oxford, right? So this is closing the loop on the circular economy. There's challenges of power. And this comes back really to your point about, but will corporate interests do that? Because we could get what I call corporate circularity, each company making its own closed loop. Like Apple could say, well, we're going to just send the phone back to us and we'll will we use those parts, but we won't tell you how we made it, and it's, it's within its own loop. Westerners own around 10,000 consumer products. There's no way we, I'm going to send this back to Apple and this back to my clothing company and my boots back to there and this chair back to the manufacturer. We won't. We need ecosystem circularity so that instead of having closed loops that return to brand where standards are owned and protected through in-house governance and proprietary technology, we have open nested loops of materials so whoever's hands this rubber ends up in can tell what kind of rubber it is and feed it back into the ecosystem of rubber so somebody else can use it. It's returned to the ecosystem. The standards are open and shared, like Fairphone. The governance is network-wide, and the technology is in the knowledge commons. For me, this is a key question of 21st century economic governance. What is it going to take to make this happen? Because if we don't make it happen, this is what will happen. 
And this won't get us to the level of circularity that we need. So let me pull back from the circular and the, that regenerative design. What about distributive by design? Okay, this is where we can say, here's the very excited, unprecedented opportunity for humanity. This is my big good news slide. Think of the four fundamental technologies for how we produce anything. You need energy, you need a means of production, you need communications and knowledge. In the 20th century, these technologies were centralized by design. Energy from an oil rig, big piece of capital that requires lots of money to build this one big piece of equipment. Production in massive factories. Communications, literally every phone call went through an operator switchboard and knowledge has been for 500 years patented and copyright. Originally intended, of course, to share ideas, but anybody who knows about pharma or IT knows that actually these turned into tools of protection and blocking innovation. So the 20th century, technologies were centralized. 21st century, unprecedented opportunity because for the first time in human history, these core technologies are asking to be distributive by design. Energy produced on solar panels, on the roof of every building, and this village in India. Production, desktop, so, uh, desktop 3D printing of buildings and plastics and ceramics and all sorts of things we haven't yet invented. Communications, you've all got a node of the internet and digital networks in your pocket, and so does this woman in her village in Tanzania. And ideas, Creative Commons licensing. So we've gone from my favorite toy, centralized to distributive. Right? Oh, you like that. So that's what the 20th century looked like. See this pattern, know that pattern, put that pattern in your head. Because this is what the 20th century, 21st century is giving us the opportunity to do. But it won't just happen. We have to make it happen. And again, let's go back to power and the different ways that this could show up. What we know today is we've got corporate dominated digital networks. They're taken up because of the size. Everyone wants to be on the network that everybody else is on. They're designed by the, de the demands of finance, capture behavior for advertising. They're governed through proprietary control. The data is captured and you, the user, you're a consumer. There's a completely different way this could play out, that we take things up because they fit and design. They're designed by the community that's going to use them. The governance is free and open source. The data, you're sovereign over your data, and as a user, you're actually a co-creator. Both of these exist simultaneously. Again, this is a key 21st century question of governance. How do we need to put in place the governance systems that will bring about this community networks approach to the digital future? And then now take that same idea and think about the energy future and the knowledge future and the production future. So to me, these are just the kinds of questions that should be at the heart of 21st century economics. We need the markets and the regulation and the commons to design structures that bring this about. So we need to be distributive and regenerative by design. If I were to show you one place in the world that you say, well, it's a lovely dream, but will that ever happen? I want to show you places where this is already happening. Anybody seen one of these before? It's a fab lab. In a fab lab, there's a 3D printer. There's, of course, internet access. They've got access to open source software and Creative Commons ideas. You can make all sorts of things going on in a fab lab. And these are popping up all over, in Barcelona, in Dublin, Amsterdam, Kamakura, in Japan. And their, their motto is, we share the recipes of how to construct our world. Now, you might say, OK, but this is all very nice, high-income country stuff. Remember the 1980s when these were the only people who had mobile phones? I think we are at that 1980s mobile phone moment with the potential of Fab Labs. Because they're also in Bhutan and in Lome in Togo and in Dar es Salaam in Kerala. And I love this image of this boy. I used to live in Tanzania, so I feel like I could talk to this boy. This boy is playing with 3D electronics. And the Fab Lab has brought that opportunity to him way beyond the pri before the private sector is going to bring it and way beyond before the state is going to bring it. This is the commons, jumping technological possibility. If this takes off, and this is already taking off, this is where fab labs are right now around the world, and this is how they're growing. They're growing exponentially. And the question is, what happens if they continue to grow exponentially? And by the way, what kind of governance need to be put in place to protect their ability to grow exponentially? Then we've got a commons-based network of energy, production, communication, and knowledge sharing. And this has never happened before. And this is the last big conceptual slide I really want to share, which is the fab city movement says we need to redesign our cities. So 20th century cities were pito, product in, products came in, we used them, and we sent trash out. 
This is the linear degenerative design that I've showed you before, that take, make, use, lose. 21st century cities need to be Dido. If you go out the room today going Pito and Dido, you'll be so in with the lingo, right? You'll be at the forefront. So data comes in and data goes out, but atoms are heavy. I mean, look, right? This is heavy. Why would you ship this around the world? This should stay local in the south of England, let's say, and be refurbished and remanufactured and used here. But the ideas of how it was made, they can fly around the world on our phones. So materials recirculate locally, and information circulates globally. And if you want the cool word for it, it's cosmolocal production. You heard it here first. Uh, I didn't make that up. But this is the word, this is the new language that's being shaped by those at the heart of the fab movement. They're shaping a language because they're shaping a new paradigm. To me, this is the way our 21st century economies actually would make sense. It's far more regenerative by design. And look, it's far more distributive by design. At the heart of it, SMEs and neighborhoods and fab labs and people who own their own access to the equipment and the ability to generate energy. This is the big governance question. How do we bring about an a, a economic system that actually is structured like this? Because we all know there's plenty of vested interests who really don't want this to happen. I would much rather capture these production networks than these digital networks. To me, this is what we should be focusing on, this possibility. So to get into the donut, we need to be distributive and regenerative. And here's the last thought, and it's going to Robert's point. Challenge is this. We have economies that need to grow, whether or not they make us thrive. And that's because they are structurally dependent upon growth. We have a financial system that, at the heart of the financial sector, demands a maximum rate of return. It puts pressure on publicly traded companies to show that every quarter they have growing sales, growing market share, and growing profits. And so they have to follow strategies that drive growth and sell more stuff to consumers. We have a political system that demands uh, growth. If you, you know, no, no country wants to lose their place in this G20 family photo. But if any one nation stops growing, they will be booted out by the next emerging powerhouse. To me, this is really a question of global governance. How could we create a new form of global governance that doesn't require for you to have an endlessly growing GDP so you keep a place at the world's geopolitical table to keep up with all your neighbors who are growing to keep up with you? It's a, a massive collective action problem in growth. And lastly, we are structurally dependent on growth thanks to a century of consumerist propaganda that has convinced us through advertising, through propaganda, that we improve ourselves, we transform ourselves every time we buy something more. How do we undo that extraordinarily clever psychological story we've been told? So we're hooked into structural dependence upon endless growth. And here's the, here's the rub. This is nature's growth curve. And by the way, back to the point on populations, this is also how populations grow. They grow and then they plateau. It matters where we plateau, but they come to a plateau. Humans do. Any biologist, any ecologist will tell you this is how nature grows, from your children's feet to a tree. Nature grows, then it grows up and comes to mature and it thrives. And it's only by growing up that it can thrive. Anything in nature that tries to grow forever will destroy itself or the system on which it depends and in our own bodies. We know that, and we call it cancer, and we do everything that we can to stop it and bring our bodies back into balance. So I think this is the existential economic question of our times. What we need are economies that enable us to thrive whether or not they grow. And you might have low-income countries like Ethiopia and Nepal, which are growing actually quite fast growth rates. Maybe they're around here, but we're sitting in one of the high-income countries that is sort of around here. And I'm not saying we should flatten out. I'm saying we should become growth agnostic because what we really need is to be distributive and regenerative. And to the extent that we're continually structurally dependent upon growth, we won't allow ourselves to pursue that. So we are still too enwrapped to 20th century economic ideas. They still dominate the syllabus of 17 and 18 year olds studying A-levels and students in universities like this one and the world over. And it is in no way equipping us and the next generation for the challenges that we already lie ahead. I profoundly believe we need to put these new economic ideas at the heart of economics and at the heart of the way we think about global economic governance and government. So there's a lot of work to do. And it's a very, very exciting time to be an economist if we can embrace these challenges. 
My book sets out seven ways to think like a 21st century economist, and I want to leave you with an invitation, because together with Rethinking Economics, which is the student movement demanding for change, and together with these fantastic judges, Eric Beinhocker, Mariana Mattacato, Steve Keen, Nyla Kabir, Nancy Fobre, we are looking for an eighth way to think like a 21st century economist. So if you've got a great idea, a really pithy idea, that should be at the heart of 21st century economics, and you think you could express it in three minutes or less, that means a thousand words of text, or a three minute video, or a song, or a rap, please enter our competition. It's for, high, for school students, for university students, and for everybody, members of the public. We'd love to hear your ideas. It's open till April 15th. I'm gonna stop on that, and really look forward to turning this into a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, that was really quite something. And while we've been uh, on air, and while you've been talking, there's a new member of the, uh, the, of the population that's just been born to my sister. Um, so it's quite an amazing auntie moment. So I'm now an auntie, um, third time over. But it's just an amazing moment to think, what is, what's Hugo's, as he's just been born an hour ago, um, what's his future look like? What is, where are we going to be when he's sort of 20? What kind of economics is he going to be taught? Mm. Where are we going to be when he's 40, right? On all of these big questions. Mm. But anyway, let's, let's open it up. Um, I can see somebody's already got the mic. Brilliant. Let's take, what, three questions, maybe at a time. Um, and then you've generously given us till seven, Kate. So we've mm -hmm. got uh, 25 minutes. So please keep your questions short. And uh, so just briefly introduce yourself and then your question. Okay. Please. Uh, my name is Ralph Schroeder. I teach here. Not yeah. at the Blavatnik, but elsewhere. Um, I'm just wondering, the only example that you showed of uh, the state level being able to do something is China, and I would suggest okay. that that may not be a very good example. I mean, I think China gets a bad press, perhaps unduly, but, you know, the Chinese don't have to worry about raising taxes, and the Chinese don't have to worry about democratic inputs necessarily into shaping technology. Can you think of other states that are doing the right thing in donut economics? Thank you. And I saw a question at the back. Yeah. We'll, we'll come, we're going to come for, to this side of the room and then we'll move around the next box of questions. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mehdi Shiva. I'm the economist at Government Outcomes Lab here. Um, to me, it seems like that donut economics only work if all players decide to cooperate. So what, what about moral hazard? What about free riding? Like, What's happening to climate change arena now in the world is that there are a couple of countries that they say we do not want to cooperate and there will be lots of benefits for them if all countries decide to cooperate, mm -hmm. reduce their growth, go for green energy, and there are just a couple of them that don't want to go with that. They, they could just produce more and more and win over the world. Yeah, great, thank you very much. This kind of real question about cooperation, how much we need of it and where, how many free riders we can sustain. Any questions here? Yeah. I'm Jose Maria, I'm a doctoral student here at the, at the school. I wonder, um, when I hear you speak, I wonder whether you get a lot of pushback uh, on the look of certainties. It would seem that embracing your ideas would mean also embracing a lot of uncertainty and a lot of mm -hmm. um, sort of opportunity, maybe to think solutions, but also to embrace that at this present moment, we don't have all the solutions ready. So what's been your uh, sort of interaction with the pushback against the notion of uncertainty? Great, Great questions. Um, okay, the first point. So yes, the only example I showed of a state uh, with respect to the donut was China. That's because it's the only picture I have of a government representative saying, uh, let's use this as a paradigm. and and and. I will say, China is the only government that I've heard say what we are intending to bring about is an ecological civilization. I would love the British government to stand up and say that. I would love to hear the European Union say that. I know China says many things, right? Belt and roadway, ecological civilization. There's, there's a lot going on. But even that that concept is there to be worked with is fascinating. However, let me, other states, okay. New Zealand, right? Setting the ambition to bring about a well-being economy. And... Costa Rica and Scotland and Wales are getting together and creating a new alliance of governance that 
aren't trying to stick their place in the G20 by being the biggest GDP, but actually are going off and doing something different. Sometimes there's an advantage to being a smaller player that you can go and do something more interesting. So, and in fact, the Associate Minister of Finance in, in New Zealand about six months ago gave a speech in which he said, we need to bring about a donut economy in Sweden, in Finland, sorry, in New Zealand. And of course, I think, what have I done that people are now going around talking about donuts? But I was also delighted that he was using that concept. Kate, can I just, so I, in, mm. in your question, there was something about sort of the Chinese government not having to raise taxes. So sort of, you, when you've got a centralized or not having to worry about democracy. So in a way, if you've got a, if you've got a centralized government, this is a much easier vision. To, at least that's what I understood. Where sort of how do you get? Yeah. So how do you get the population, I guess, implicit on board with this agenda? I guess is part of the the, the question. Okay. Um, well, I. But I'm going to answer that by giving examples of democratic countries that are doing things. So Sweden, on the first of January last year, introduced its Climate Change Act, which commits the country of Sweden to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2045 and holds every government between now and then legally to account. It doesn't cost a lot of money to do it. It's an amazingly strong, legal and loud and long message to industry that if you are in the business of fossil fuels, you better get out and get into the business of energy. And by the way, it needs to be renewable. So to me, it's a really good example of government using vision and regulation that no government can say, well, we don't have the, the public budget to do that. You have the mandate and the ability to set a new course for your nation. Uh, the government of Wales has the Future Generations Act. There's now a woman called Sophie Howe is the Future Generations Commissioner. Every piece of legislation that's brought for consideration is considered by the Future Generations Commissioner. Again, that doesn't cost a lot of money to do that, but it brings the future into the present. And if we can be smart about the way we talk to voters, it's quite appealing, actually, to live in a, a society where kids can play out in the fresh air and you can bike to school and feel safe and schools and health centers are well-funded because we've got a more distributive economy and people can own small businesses and actually own their own energy system on the roof of their house. There's a lot of desirability in that. Um, the question about free riding, really important question, yes. And that's why I'm very happy I'm in a school of government. And I think that's exactly the kind of question that needs to be tackled when we think about the governance required to bring about these kind of economies. Of course, we've seen... 25 years of stalemate, you could say, at the UNFCCC. And now we see not nations, but largely cities saying, well, we're just going to do it anyway. States, what are, states within the US, well, our, our president may not be acting, but we're going to act. And there's something rising up about showing leadership from within. And you, you might be a free rider today. You might actually get left behind and be the last one holding the risk and you'll be ending up with the stranded assets. So there's something flipping about solar becoming just financially more uh, smarter mm. than fossil fuels that, that's moving that along. And then the, the, the pushback, am I introducing a lot of uncertainties? I didn't talk about one of the seven ways of thinking that I have at the heart of my book, which is moving from the very reductionist, almost mechanical supply and demand to complexity thinking. But I think every student should be taught complexity thinking, the fundamentals of feedback, reinforcing and balancing feedback loops. The world is complex. Let's, mm. let's, let's recognize that. So uncertainty is all around us. We live with it. So let's learn to understand it. Let's see it. A country like Finland, I say, is embracing the uncertainty of policymaking. Rather than, you know, you have political parties. They come up with their manifesto. We're going to do these policies. And when they get into power, they put the policy in place and then spend a lot of energy trying to show why it was a good policy after all. Mm -hmm. If you recognize that the, the world is inherently uncertain, we don't know how policies are going to work out, Finland has a, a program called Experimental Finland. Trust the Finnish, right? They would be out there, Experimental Finland. They've got about 27 policy experiments running. They come up with the idea, how should we teach multiple languages to students in school? How can we get more people biking to school? Should we have a universal basic income for the long-term unemployed? Okay. Towns or regions within the country say, we will trial that. They do it as a trial. They finish it, and then they assess it, and they say, did it work or not? Shall we expand it? So it's not that the policy failed. It's that we learned something. But to make it work, we need to change our politics. And especially in the UK, where we have these two parties baying at each other across the House of Parliament, that's not a space that allows for experimental policymaking. So again, the format of policy, policymaking, defines the space for policy options. Great. Thank you. Let's come to this side. We're going to flip over to this side and three thoughts from this side of the room. Yeah. My name's Danny. Uh, I'm a uh, doctoral student 
political scientist, not not an not an economist. Um, <laughs> but I think the central critique or the central obstacle that you have to kind of overcome here is this idea that you know Thomas Malthus could have given this presentation in some sense, right? This idea of this looming catastrophe, and what I am concerned about is the idea that one can. You know, we already have a, a method for decentralization of ideas, and it is a market. Um, and the idea that there may be a demand for sustainable solutions uh, to these kinds of ideas that should be incentivized in a market kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Isn't the market kind of, uh, in, in a sense, the answer to what you're looking for? You're looking for a way to reward this kind of decentralized thinking. And I was just wondering if you comment. Sorry, I haven't fully understood what you mean, the market of ideas and, and Sure. So, so so you're looking for you're looking for a set of solutions and you're trying mm. to decentralize the idea of, of, of solutions. Or at least that's what I'm getting. You, you you need some state action is what you're saying, but what you need is to encourage people to come up with answers to the to the ecological crisis. And I'm asking, don't we already have a market for ideas? Isn't there already you know an idea don't we already have a forum where someone can propose a solution and get, there's a set of incentives to, yeah, uh, to get those solutions. That's all I'm asking for. Okay. Thank you. So can we restructure and harness the market to deliver on yeah. some of this? Great. Hi, uh, my name's Sophia. Um, I was just wondering, it was very disheartening to see, well, see the debate and discussion in the Commons about climate change and how poorly attended it was. What do you see as the greatest barriers of getting environmental issues actually on the agenda? And I feel there's something innate in humans which has a short-sightedness and an inability to see beyond kind of our own generation, I suppose. Mm. And what do you think is the biggest barrier to that? Great. So if anyone hadn't seen, there was a debate in the House of Commons last week, right, that was in uh, light of all the students striking and saying, look, really, politicians, please come together and sort this out. And the House of Commons was almost empty. It was a few politicians who turned up. So how do we get it onto the political agenda? Yeah, question at the back there. Hi, uh, I'm Conrad. I'm an economist from Bristol. Um, I guess, so... One of the big takeaways that I got from this is that a big, a big part of this is the proprietary information and proprietary knowledge. And sort of in the limit, it's about loosening patents or getting rid of patents or at least making generics more accessible. Yeah. And so I guess, I mean, part of that is, you know, influencing governments and corporations and that to do that. But how do you get the science community on board? Because a lot of scientists or engineers, or I mean, sort of classify them how you will, um, it's sort of the, the dream is to come up with a great idea and then corporatize it and make it big. And so it sort of be the next Bill Gates or the next uh, Steve Jobs or that sort of thing, right? And so how do you get, you know, these people on board to agree with the idea of open knowledge and open access and, and to facilitate the modular aspect of all of this? Great, thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Surely the market is a already a tool for trying out lots of different ideas. So Adam Smith was onto something, right? Markets are brilliant. They have an amazing way of coordinating the interests of millions of people who never need meat, but can connect and communicate through the price mechanism. Of course, there's a limit to it, and the limits are pretty big, that markets only value, only value what's priced, and they only serve those who can pay. And so those are two pretty massive caveats. And again, when we start with the market and then everything that falls outside of market contracts we, shows up as externalities, what you described as the looming catastrophe, and I'd say it's not only looming, it's, you know, it's the, the surrounding catastrophes, um, they of course show up as externalities. So you could say in the 20th century, externalities were relatively small in relation to the full size of market activity. These days, the externalities seem pretty darn preoccupying. They seem to be headlines almost every day, whether it's about the scale of inequality or the malls in the UK being on fire in February and, 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 and the, all over the world. Therefore, it seems that the conditions of the world no longer fit the idea that we can rely on the market mechanism. And of course, there's no such thing as the free market, right? I, when anyone says, you know, that the free market, I say, take me to the free market. I've never been to one. Where is it? Because every market, of course, is embedded in regulations. We just become so used to them, we don't see them. And this, Ha Jun Chang is excellent on this point, that, that the regulations are all around us, 
Um, and as Polanyi wrote, you know, there's no such thing as deregulation, there's just re-regulation. It's just re-regulating markets in other people's interests. And once you start looking at it from that point of view, you, you see the relationship between the market and state is that it's, it, they're inseparable. So I, I think markets can work, absolutely. And I'm, as I said, I would never want to live in an economy that lacked them, but so too do the commons. And they've been neglected for, well, many decades, probably since Garrett Hardin wrote his piece about the tragedy of the commons in 1968. And it took Ellen Ostrom to come back and say, well, it's funny, actually, the commons are working. So I'll, I'll segue to the, the question about, um, is, it, is it a point about patents and we just need more generics? Mm. I'm not actually advocating more generics because open source is a very different thing. It's a completely different philosophy than saying, let's just have more things that come off patent and, and are allowed to be generic. It's a whole different philosophy of innovation. Um, and, and you fairly said, you know, but, what, but lots of people go into tech and they want to develop that next big thing and then make loads of money, to which I would say, really? Think about some of the people who made the most important innovations. Jonas Salk, who came up with the vaccine for polio. He instantly gave it away and he said, well, who can own the sun? And actually, he infuriated the science community because he then set a precedent that everybody else, you know, we want to patent everything, so he gave it away. Tim Berners-Lee, he did not invent the internet to make a whole load of money. And in fact, now, you know, we all heard in the headlines, he's saying, actually, I'll come back and try and help fix it. So often, these innovators are actually phenomenally public-minded people, and what they really want to see is that technology at work in the world having impact. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to this gentleman's point about, well, it depends on who, how it's owned and how it's financed. And often, they have to work for large corporations that then say, well, obviously, you have to patent everything and you need to show the returns on your patent, and we get trapped in these institutions that are owned and financed in such a way that the greatest innovating minds in the world end up chasing patents to block other people. It's a really interesting point that some of the world's best software designers, when they are being headhunted for jobs, they will only take a job if they can spend at least 10, 15% of their time working in open source, hmm. because otherwise they're getting trapped inside a little proprietary world of that company, and they know all the dynamism is going on over out here in open source. So I really do think that the open source movement, it's very threatening to the, to the proprietary space, but it, it has an energy and it's got some of the most creative minds in it precisely because they know it can be paradigm changing. And then back to this question about, uh, we've seen school strikes and then hardly any, um, hardly any MPs mm -hmm. go into the chamber and show up. Well, this is the real challenge. I will say that uh, I know somebody who's working on the inside of government on climate change, and I'm told off the record that, uh, off the record, she says. On, on the record. On the re <laughs> I'm told that the UK, well, let's put it on the record. I'm told the UK government's getting ambitious behind the scenes for upgrading the, climate, the 2008 Climate Change Act, which in its day was groundbreaking. First country to take on this commitment, 80% cuts by 2050. Sweden's now run ahead and said we're going to be net zero by 2045. So again, we're beginning to see this really nice competition mm. of countries upping the stakes. Let's see if the UK government is going to come through with something more ambitious. And I want to connect this back to the point somebody made right at the beginning about what's the implications of Brexit for all mm. this. My personal views, and it's a personal view, I think Brexit has been an extraordinary diversion from the real issues of our times. I would love to see, I'd be amazed to see, but I would love to see a government come out of this, whether Brexit happens or not, but come out of this and set a truly world-class, ambitious climate change, uh, climate change act. I don't feel it in the air. But the, I, all, all power to the school strikers, right? Mm. And, and we will, if, we, if we do this, we will look back from 2040, and maybe in 2040 it will seem obvious of how it begun. Oh, it was, of course, it was the day that Greta Thunberg, or the, it was the day that some corporation, or it was the day some government... From sitting here, we don't know, and that's why it makes sense to get behind things, put your energy with those momentums that you think have a chance of, of breaking through and, and making the impossible normal. Mm. Great, thank you. The neglected... In the middle of the room, thoughts, reflections. Yeah. Be the last round, I think, that we'll, we'll capture. So last thoughts, last chance. I think I failed to give my name last time. I'm John Cameron. I'm retired, so I guess I'm here on behalf of my grandchildren. Yay. Uh, um, I get all your questions. Uh, I thought you, when you described why governments feel they have to grow GMP, you left out one really, really, really important thing. Which what did is, I say? When governments feel they have, have to... to... grow their GMP. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or GDP. They, um, if you don't grow your GDP by uh, a bit more than the improvements in productivity, you get unemployment. Yes. And, you know, you grow your GDP at 2%, everyone's happy. You grow it at half percent, everyone's miserable, and unemployment mm. goes up. 
And I, and I think that's a real challenge. How does one, you know, if with donut economics it's fine, everyone redecides what we're aiming for, but unemployment on the face yeah. of it will grow. And I wonder how you deal with that. And if I'm allowed one and a half points, I just want to ask, is it, am I, I read this morning that UK CO2 emissions were less than 1880 now. Is that true oh. or is that fake news? Okay. Somebody else is nodding their head. So if you need to bat that question, Kate, there's somebody who looks like they might know the answer to that one. Right, other thoughts? You've got a question. Felicity, please. Um, I think an incredibly poignant point in your book was about how economics is the only discipline that's got away with no introversion. And um, I think there's a whole industry of people who have um, benefited from the voodoo of this idea that economics is a science. Um, and those same people seem to be the people that criticise your work as being too soft or fluffy or not based in a reality that can be measured. So I'm just interested when you get that criticism, how do you argue back? Great, thank you. And did you want to say who you were? Oh, I'm um, Felicity. I'm doing the Master of Public Policy. Great, yeah. thank you. Okay, and then you have <coughs> the last comment. Yeah, please. and um, I'm sort of part-time student and also part-time working here in Oxford. Um, so I was just wondering what your vision is for what we do with all the closed circuit products that are currently in circulation. Um, mm. Do we fix and modernize potentially the old and less efficient products? Um, if so, how? Mm. Um, or do we start afresh with new efficient open source products um, and go from there? Great, thank you. Do you have three and a half questions on that? Anyone else got what, any last burning point we want, don't want to, oh, that, Go on, Ines. Yeah, please, do introduce yourself. Okay? Yeah, go on. Um, I'm Ines Smith, and I'm, I live nearby. Um, I, I should know, but I haven't read your book. So among your seven solutions, do you, have, do you address the question of how do you change the kind of deeper social norms and values that uh, shape so many of our interactions, uh, issues around, I don't know, ownership, issues around the way we think about care work, uh, the centrality of the I, so that it's shifted towards mm. something different, uh, so that, that the human relationships become different based on compassion, ba based on, on, a, on, a more, uh, on a communal sense of, of how we relate to each other. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Let, let's take this UK carbon emissions. Was somebody nodding to say yes, it's the case that the UK carbon emissions are now lower than 1880? Yes. You were. Yes. Did you, have you read this as a statistic in the news? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it true? Is it fake news was the question? It's true, but, but UK's emissions from the 19th century were very high. Most of the emissions okay. were So for those of you who can't hear or are at live stream, it's so... The low, it's the lowest since the UK is back to 1880 levels, but it had extraordinary high levels in 1880, so it's not necessarily a good point to benchmark. Okay. Okay, so, but, but whenever we are presented with um, these kind of stats, it's really important to ask several questions. One, is this on the basis of production? So these are emissions coming off from the land mass that is known as the UK, or is this on the basis of consumption? Because there's a heck of a lot of carbon emissions in that screen and my phone and your phone and our clothes and the food that we're importing from all over the world. And then there's an ethical question about which one do we think should be accounted to us. Mm. Uh, we could debate that, but I would definitely say at least some of the consumption impact should be accounted to and attributed to us. As in those national donuts that I showed, it is attributed to us. You can also say, uh, are we taking account of our shipping and air emissions? Because, of course, every country wants to disown those. So they're sort of seen as international belonging to nobody. Mm. So there's all sorts of, I, I think there's a lot of uh, often trickery and... Um, a gloss, because there's such a desire to show that we're achieving green growth. It's the paradigm that's running ahead of itself. It's not yet proven, but people have it in their job titles, in their, uh, there's a DG Grow in Europe. I, I was delighted to go to the department called DG Grow in, in the <laughs> European Commission. Uh, it's so written in as a mentality, we're desperate to show it in the statistics, and people sometimes twist or slightly gloss the way the statistics are presented. Um, John, you're absolutely right. I didn't mention one of the really critical drivers, the dependency on growth. I was having one of those moments when you see the clock and you think, oh my goodness, I've been talking too long. I will quickly move, but yes, I missed a key one. Governments are structurally dependent upon growth because 
we, be, we continue with productivity, we, we get better at making the same stuff with fewer people or more things with the same people. And if the economy's not growing, it's not going to absorb that labor and we get unemployment. And there's one thing every government dreads, which is an unemployment queue. So absolutely. Two responses. One, of course, you can say we're all working quite a lot and there's, a, there's really interesting moves to say, shall we have a 21 hour week or a four day working week? Of course, John Maynard Keynes in 1930 wrote this very famous essay um, on the economic possibilities of our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. He believed that sort of almost today, we are the grandchildren he was imagining, that we would have met all our needs and we would just be working short working weeks. He didn't see the insatiable consumerism that was going to be kicked off. So could we move to shorter working weeks and to distributing, again, distributing, distributing that work more differently? But more deeply, I would say, we've got an economic model that chases after labor productivity. And companies, there's a very weird situation which companies are charged for hiring people. You have to pay payroll taxes. It costs money. You're taxed for hiring employees, but you get a, some sort of capital depreciation tax or reduction for buying machines. So you're charged yeah. for hiring people and you're subsidized for buying machines, and that's absurd. What we need to shift from is pursuing labor productivity to pursuing resource productivity. And of course, that's the, the big tax shift with, that we could make so that we could have a system that stops charge, taxing hiring people, tax the use of, of uh, new resources so that that drives circularity. And that means companies completely change their production systems from saying, well, let's minimize the number of people here to saying, actually, how do we use these resources more and more effectively? Actually, we need to bring more people in. So to me, that's a really big part of the shift that needs to happen. Um, Felicity's point about what's my pushback. Actually, no one has ever said it's fluffy, um, <laughs> but they might say it's a straw man case, uh, to which I just say, bring me a first diagram, mm. bring me a biggest picture. Uh, I rest my case. And by the way, and they say, we're we just talking about Econ 101. And I say, it's the one that rules the world. So my, put, my pushback is actually, I've, I've sort of had enough of arguing it. And I sincerely believe that 21st century economics will be practiced first and theorized later. And if you want to understand 21st century economics, I would say go and find it in a mm. fab lab, in a city that's transforming. So I'm now dedicating my time to putting it into practice. And for the last three days, I've been sitting with a small team at my kitchen table who are here, I'm delighted. And we've just founded the Donut Economics Action Lab. It's action because we're doing, and it's a lab because everything's an experiment. And we're figuring out, and we're working with cities, we're working with the C40 to create a city tool that cities around the world can use, starting in Amsterdam. We've just been asked to work with a bank in Asia. What would it look like for banks to, to bring the banking sector into the donut? Working with companies, working with communities, working with schools. Let's just put this into practice and let's shut down the arguments by showing it. Because I, there, there may be questions of free riding, but there's also a very big community that just wants to run ahead and start putting it into practice. Hmm. Um, Daisy's point about uh, what, what do you do with existing closed circuit mm. products? I don't know what we do with those, and that's a really important question about transformation, transition between systems, but certainly a lot of people are pushing for the right to repair. So I should have the right to be able to get inside a product and have the right to repair. And these kinds of legislative tweaks are going to transform the basis of production. And then I'll end with Inez's point. Uh, does donut economics explore the deeper norms and values? A little bit in a chapter called Nurture Human Nature, because our, it's, in both our, it's in our nature, and I have 10-year-old twins, and I live with it every day, and we all see it, right? Competition, competitiveness, and collaboration. If you play Monopoly with your kids, you nurture competition. And the kids who are good at it, people say, hey, you should go into business. Mm. Try playing Pandemic. Anyone play Pandemic? It's an amazing collaborative game where you work as one team, and you rid the world of disease, and it demands completely different skills. And when I played it with my kids, I was so struck that we don't know how to collaborate. We're mm. having to figure out just how to be a team. Where, why didn't we learn this in our education? Where are those collaborative skills? So I touch on it in my book, but you know what? Maybe that's one of the eight ways to think. Mm. Enter the competition. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kate. It's been a really inspiring hour and a half. So thank you on behalf thank of you. all of us. Thank you. <laughs>